good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to anyone who's tuning in. Um, my name is Jerry Lee Franich, and I am a proud Yuan woman from Ulladulla, and I'm currently residing on Camaragal land. Um, and I'm currently in my final three terms of uh, a criminology and criminal justice degree at UNSW. Um, and today we will be having a conversation with Sergeant Wendy Kelly, who um, is going to just talk us through the involvement, her involvement in the police force and kind of how she has navigated that process um, being an Indigenous woman. Um, so before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're watching from or I'm listening from. Um, and I would like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I would like to further that respect to any Indigenous and non-Indigenous person listening in today. I will pass to Sergeant Wendy to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name's Wendy Kelly. Um, I've been in the police service now for 21 years. Um, most of my policing has been in communities, um, small towns, that sort of that sort of thing. I'm currently based um, in a small town called Geraldton. So yeah, and I'm doing youth policing there, which um, I have done once before, but it's it's concentrating on trying to divert the young ones from the court systems um, and giving them alternatives basically to um, rather than them going out and offending and stuff like that. So getting them involved in programs mm -hmm. um, and also going to schools, talking to uh, the girls groups at the schools. Um, out at Warakurna it was... Um, I was the brevet sergeant out there and there was only myself and Revis Ryder, the senior sergeant. Um, and it was basically a similar thing with the youth is trying to divert them from the courts. Um, we had a few issues with some of the kids, but there, what we found was that the community wanted to get involved in that process as well. So we would present the children to the elders and the community and let them have their say and be, be in um, consultation with us in regards to their punishments. So, yeah, so it worked out really well. The, the community were behind us 100%. So, yeah, it, it worked out really well. That's super good. Um, mm. So just to kind of backtrack just a little bit, um, I'm interested in finding out how you became involved in the police force and kind of what led you to want to become a police officer. Look, I have not had a, a very... Um, I, I've got a colourful past, put it that way. And... For years, I was off the rails, um, did a lot of drinking and stuff like that. Uh, my last night of drinking, I ended up, in, in 92, I ended up with my throat cut. So I, I thought, well, I've, I've got to stop. I've, I'm either going to be dead or in jail, the way I was going. So I managed to stop, got a lot of support and help through all that. And still don't drink today. So it's been 28 years or something, 29 years. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, then I have... I grew up in a foster family um, and I'm still with them 58 years later. It's, but two of my foster brothers were police. Um, they were police even when I was off the rails and it was it was quite funny. One of them used to just try and lecture me and <laughs> and I just, yeah, whatever. And um, the other one would just shake his head and just go, oh, dear, in trouble again. Yeah, I say. So, yeah, but then always wanted to be like, like them. But as I got older as well, I could see some of the, um, the, the way people were treated by police and myself included. 
it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I didn't have a bad relationship with the police, but having said that, you know, you were locked up at the drop of a hat and stuff like that. So I, for me, I thought, you know what, I need, I need to be in this force to be able to help others as well and to help them through those processes where it's not as traumatic, um, if I could. So that's why I joined up. I joined as a liaison officer to start off with in uh, 99. So, and was in the city probably for about 18 months, but then I went bush and then I hadn't been back, back to the city. So you would say that because of your colourful past and kind of like the kind of uh, upbringing that you had and being in a foster family and being around um, the two foster brothers, um, you were able to kind of use your experiences and kind of your knowledge to kind of help people upcoming to see that police officers and the police force doesn't have to be an issue if you are in contact with the right people? Absolutely. Absolutely. That sort of gave me, I guess, the empathy that I have for Mm. people because I see them out on the street. And I try and tell the recruits these days is don't be putting everybody in the same basket because we're not all the same, you know. They're all, everybody's different. And wherever you're from, those people are different as well. So from different from like I'm a Noongar from Perth in the Southwest. So Noongars are different to the Matu people out in Maluna where I worked for nine years. You know, it, there's differences. So it's, it's trying to teach the new ones these days, the new police, um, that not everybody's the same. So, and they need to respect that. They need to, if they want to go bush, find out, do some research first as to where you're going, find out their traditions in there. Because there's a lot of um, areas where I've been where they're still very cultural in their ways. So you need to, you need to understand that um, and respect that. So, yeah. But it's, um, for me, joining, it, that was, it was like I felt I needed to be there for the people in the lockups and things like that to just... Like I say, just ease their tension, um, get them to speak to the police rather than yelling at them and that for the police to not yell at the people either, you know, to just talk with them, not at them, you know what I mean? So, yeah, over my career, it's been a lot of that happening. So, hmm. um, Yeah, I actually read an article um, before this interview or conversation and um, I can't remember whether it was you or your colleague and you had just said that you would drive down the road and people would actually be waving at the, like waving at you guys and that it was just a really different kind of like situation and that the community actually believed in the people who were actually trying to keep them safe. Yes. Yes. And that's, and all it is, is getting out of your vehicle mm going and talking to a group that is sitting there or going into, you know, pull up at a house if there's people out there, go in and have a chat with them, Mm. you know. And then as, yeah, as we go past, we were waving and all the kids would wave and, you know, everybody was waving. And um, even since leaving um, Warrakuna as well, it's it's still the same for me. It's like Mm. everywhere I go, I went to Kalgoorlie and it's waving to people just talking, getting out of the vehicle and just talking with everybody, you know, and they love it. They love it. So it just breaks down those barriers. Talk me through what um, kind of when you're working back at Warakuna Police Station, what was the day in, day out things that would happen? Sometimes we'd be, we'd be sitting there going through paperwork or whatever we had to do in the mornings and that, and we might get a call to say that somebody was going off in the community. Mm. So we jump in the car and we the police station was actually about three kilometres away right. from the, from the community. So we'd jump in the car, we'd go down there, 
um, find out what was going on, talk to people, um, and then we'd locate the the person of interest who we had to speak to, um, just find out what was happening with them, you know, why they why they were angry or what, and also too was there, if there was anything that we could do. A lot of the time, you know, it was uh, domestic related. So we'd go and speak to, um, if it was a male, we'd go and speak to the female as well and maybe possibly just take the female and kids away for the day or something just to separate them so that it didn't continue, you know, um, not necessarily charging because it was just a, an argument really, you know. Um, so, yeah, that sort of thing. Going to the school, um, talking with the kids, basically helping out at the nursing post if we had to. If there was um, somebody there playing up, we'd just go there or the community office. Um, sometimes people were playing up there because they didn't get their money for whatever reason. And that wasn't every day. Um, other days we would go to other communities. We had two other communities, uh, one which was 100 kilometres away. So we'd go and visit down there, make sure everybody was happy and okay and, you know, if there was anything they needed and stuff like that. The other community was 170 kilometres away. So that took a few, and it was all on dirt roads. So the one that was 170 kilometres was just a bit of a goat track really. But um, so, yeah, so that takes a few hours to get out there. And same thing, going to the school out there, talking with the principal, um, playing a bit of sport with the kids and uh, going to the community office, see if everybody was okay there. And, yeah, just making sure, just and generally driving around the communities and just talking with everyone. Over your whole career kind of in the police force and kind of everything that you've done during it, so um, you would have seen a drastic change from when you first um, went into the force till now. So, like... What were the like differences that you could see within um, Indigenous communities and kind of their um, participation with the police force? So what was it like before you kind of got and you were able to build them community connections till now? From what I um, understand, like when I was at Waluna, when I first went bush, mm -hmm. um, I got to know specifically the women in those areas because... The women in these communities are the stronger ones. They run the communities. You know, they have that power. But what I did see was that um, they, they did start to report things a lot more, um, especially domestic violence incidents. We didn't, half the time, we didn't even know until perhaps they might have gone to the nursing post or something like that but they were actually actively coming to the police station and reporting things. Um, so that was a huge change. Also, what was happening too was um, we ended up getting the Department of Child Protection in these towns as well to help with the kids. And I would go out with the lady um, who was at Waluna and we'd, you know, talk to kids and, you know, she would mainly, I'd be there and talk with the parents and just making sure family life was okay for them, you know. Wherever I've been, I've always had to teach the police and the communities in regards to um, each other and to show their respect to, for each other. When I was in Waluna, we, we were getting a huge influx of new officers and I was, uh, I was tasked to do a cultural awareness day and I thought my goodness how am I going to do this you know so what I ended up doing was asking the ladies if there was anywhere where we could go bush for the day and take these new officers have have bush food um and everything like that so we we did we went out bush the ladies were teaching the police how to do the making damper and putting the ruse in the fires and things like that the tails and the um, and the police were eating them. Then at the end of it, what I did say while we were having lunch, I said, okay, new police, because a lot of them were English, let, tell your stories, basically. 
So they did, and it was not unsimilar. Some of them were, it was not unsimilar to our local community because, you know, they weren't born with silver spoons in their mouths. There was a lot of um, stuff happening in England and stuff like that, gangs and all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, and so it gave the community that knowledge of those officers that, hey, you know, they did it hard. So, and it just, look, it just broke down the barriers and then the people told them all about their community and they did this sharing, you know, and it was just amazing. And um, the guys at the end of it came to me and said, Wendy, that was the best day that we ever had, you know. So it's, and I've, I've noticed that um, as I've gone further and further into my career is that how the police have changed their attitude. Um, but because of the likes of myself and other Aboriginal police constantly, constantly teaching them how to behave, I guess, in these communities. So, but they appreciate it too because there's a lot of stuff they don't know. And when they do find out, it's like, wow, you know, we had no idea. And, but then they implement it, you know, and it's, yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah. Really good. What do you think would be the best way for other states and territories to kind of follow in the same footsteps? Because I know it would be a little bit different because um, uh, the Warakuna police station was specifically run by Indigenous people. So there was a lot more trusting in that aspect. But um, through your kind of experience and like going and finding cadets and stuff like that, what do you think would be the best way that other states and territories could kind of help bridge the gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous communities? Look, it's all about communication and um, community engagement. So rather than driving up and down, up and down, up and down a street, looking for someone, jump out your car and say, look, you know, we're looking for so-and-so. Is it possible um, if he comes home or something? You can let him know and that sort of thing. Don't be gung-ho. You know what I mean? It's, um, that doesn't work. You get the backup of people all the time if you do it that way. It's just, yeah, look. And, and other communities where I've been, it, it's all been about community engagement. You know, it's um, getting involved in local activities. The guys get involved with the football because um, these communities love their football. Um, and for me, it was, like I say, getting involved with the ladies, um, going to meetings, women's meetings, um, going out bush for the day with the ladies and finding out about bush tucker and stuff like that you know, um, spending that time. And that's, that's what breaks down these barriers. It really does, because it does form a trust. Also, too, is in, if there is that process where they, people have to go to court, it's like, or if they have a warrant, you know, <clears throat> if that person's there, explain it to them, because sometimes they don't understand. You've got a warrant. Or what was that for? And when, as soon as you mentioned the charge, I go, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. So, okay, let's go to court and let's get this done for you. So that way you're not looking over your shoulder anymore, that sort of thing. And it's all about how you communicate that. I really, really believe that that is the key. You have definitely um, risen to the occasion and just done all of these amazing things. And... Um, just like doing my own, I only had to type in your um, name in Google and there were millions upon millions of things coming up about you. And it was just, it was really wow. nice to see that someone was able to kind of just make that change and that other states around Australia are seriously trying to implement it. And it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you and kind of just having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for um, taking the time out of your day to do this. Um, and, yeah, it was really nice talking to you. No, you are more than welcome. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you.